In this presentation, I will be talking about social structure, land ownership and settlement patterns. Before covering social structure, let's look at the definition of sociology. Sociology is the study of social life, change and social causes, consequences of human behavior in society. Sociology covers all these subjects. We have already dealt with economics, history and political science in the previous classes. This is probably the most foundational one-liner in sociology. Family is the basic unit of society. The first definition is an older one covering the simplest form of family. The second one, more modern, attempts to cover latest social trends like same-sex couples, adopted children. Even the attempt to redefine the concept of family proves that family is still a very important unit of society. Family serves certain essential and non-essential functions, producing a child, teaching him or her the ways of the society, and finally placing them in a social role have always been the function of a family. Previously, during the times of larger families, family also dictated the individual's religion, occupation, primary education, primary health care. Political control was also inherited. Parsons' model of society places family in a central role with respect to other social institutions, religious, economic, educational and political. In the Indian context, family was an essential social entity and economic entity. Its workings were so complex that the British treated the Hindu joint family as even a separate legal entity with its own customs. Family is the basic unit of society, especially in the village social structure. Individual families often identified themselves as a part of an extended family. A few such families formed a certain caste or occupational cluster. Many such castes or family clusters made up the village, their interrelationship dictated by the customs of the village mostly unchanging despite the passage of time. This is a satellite image of Tichpalli village in Telangana. A closer look shows there are no distinct boundaries between individual buildings. In this village study conducted for her thesis, Isha wished to observe the spatial features which seem to knit a village together as a community. Interestingly, she observes that apart from the motorable pakka roads, there are small pedestrian paths which cut through the clusters. These paths open to common courts which are shared among the houses in the cluster. Activities in these can be conducted as per neighborly understanding. However, newer developments in the same village lack these organic shared spaces. Could this be the result of the more modern concept of individual ownership of land? Before the advent of modern political structure, even cities in India were built in clusters. The city of Ahmedabad was founded in 1411. In the beginning, the city had about 40 guilds, professional, absorbing people from various castes. Each guild occupied their own space, a pole. By 1872, these poles were reportedly occupied by members of the same caste, similar occupation. However, the rich and the poor lived side by side. At the community level, each pole was represented by the Mahajan. Management of local issues was done by the community. City-level management like finance, tolls and law were taken care of by the government headed by the governor while the Nagar Seth negotiated between the government and the Mahajans. This social structure is directly reflected in how the city is laid out. The government offices and houses of the nobles were laid out in the core, marked in red. The major roads marked in red were also laid out by the government, but the padas and the poles were just negotiated among the community. Ownership Formerly, the poles used to separate independent identities in the city. The area of each of the poles was owned by the community that resided in it. The houses were individually owned and the public areas, that is the streets and the communal space, the communal hall, were commonly owned by the residents of the pole. Elements indicating ownership like a wall and gateway are found at the level of the pole. Close to the entry gate are the public spaces like the quadrangle, well and community hall. 
While the houses were private spaces, the streets outside the house belonged to the community and were the heart of community life. Activities on the street were dictated only by community sanction. This is a layout of a pole showing transitions from the communal to the private spaces. A closer look at the footprint of each house shows how houses big and small, people rich and poor, lived side by side. Some of these houses were clearly partitioned into smaller independent portions. What is the meaning of planning in such a context? Firstly, there is master plan which which is where the ruler, planner, architect or whoever is in charge comes up with a design and implements that consciously on a certain piece of land. The second kind of planning might be understood as standardization whereby all structures follow the same template using the same repeated elements. Finally, the idea of planning as coordination. Rather than using a single design or repetitive elements, cities can also be planned by a certain set of rules that coordinate the position and form of any new additions in relation to the existing built form. These were rarely codified and were just commonly understood. Let's do a quick recall of the modern political structure. The modern state dealt with each individual without any intermediate systems. Therefore, proprietorship also became essentially individual. The modern system of government also did away with the concept of land as a community resource replaced by land as private property. However, the benefits of local governance cannot be ignored. The 73rd and 74th amendments of the constitution mandated the creation of municipal corporations and panchayats as representative local bodies within a democratic structure of government. Since the state now controls all the land within its territory, it requires a formal procedure to get approval for a building proposal. First, we need to have a clear title of the land. Then, you need to get clearance whether the land that you hold is coming under the correct zone for the development that you are proposing. And then you apply to the respective authority for building approval. Once the building is complete, you apply for a completion certificate. With the completion certificate, you can get service connections like electricity and water. Once these connections have been made, you finally get the occupancy certificate which makes it legal for people to actually use your building. This is an extract from the Model Building Codes and Bylaws 2016 showing the various authorities that need to give permissions depending on the project. So this is how earlier negotiations were made. The individual belonged to the family, which then belonged to a community. The various communities negotiated amongst each other and then the state. The actions of the state are now strictly codified in laws and codes. On behalf of the state, various authorities enforce these codes. It is difficult for the average individual to negotiate with these multiple authorities. The professional, an architect for example, is trained in the legalities of the building process. He can help the individual negotiate the legalities. Previously, the community formed the link between the individual and the state, whereas now, professionals perform the same function. Design is often blamed for lack of community spirit in modern communities. But is it the design or the laws that control development that need to be relooked?